I was in Denver, Colorado, and my wife had a great job. She was working as a, a computer programmer in the dot-com boom, and so there was this office. They had, a, they had an office mom. They actually hired two women to just be moms to the rest of the people who worked in the office. So that means every day they would bring like fudge sickles and, and uh, hot chocolate and whatnot. Uh, why was it chocolate? I don't know. That's just on my mind. So anyway, they, they would be like the moms. And so this is the dot-com bubble. Everybody was being well taken care of. So my wife was being well taken care of, which meant I was being well taken care of, and therefore I didn't need to have a job. But I got a job anyway because I felt like, you know, I'm the dude, I need to do something. So um, I can't just study all the time, I have to get a job. So I got a job, and my job was selling newspapers, newspaper subscriptions. Um, in Denver at the time, there was a price war going on between the two different newspapers that were there. There was the Denver Post, and there was the Rocky Mountain News. And the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News had an agreement that was sort of either a state law or a federal law. I don't remember which, but it was this. If you sell a seven-day-a-week subscription, you can't go below the certain price. You can't go below a certain price of the subscription. And so even though there were two newspapers and they were trying to do a price war, they couldn't get below this certain price and so once you reach that point, that price point, then the two newspapers are exactly the same in price. And so now what are you going to do? How do you compete? Well, at this particular point in time, they found a loophole in the law. If you remove one day, then you're not selling a seven-day subscription. You're selling a six-day subscription. And the law was silent on six-day subscriptions. And so what they would do is they would say, okay, we'll sell you a six-day subscriptions, and now we can cut the price no matter what. And it was nuts. It was crazy. I'll tell you how bad it was. I would go to a grocery store with a stack of free newspapers that I would hand out to people who were there, and I would have my little booth set up, and I would take people's subscriptions, and guess how much it was? It was $4.95 for one of these six-day subscriptions for the year. $4.95 today gets you the Denver Post for 365 days minus all the Mondays. Because we weren't, it was a six day subscription. You got the Sunday paper, you got all the Wednesday coupons if you like that kind of thing. You didn't get one of the days, I can't remember what it was. I think it was Monday that you didn't get something along those lines. But the whole year for just $5. Now you tell me, is that good news? I, I get the Journal and Courier, it's the only local newspaper really here. And you know, so that's the one I subscribe to and I pay about $20 a month to get the subscription. So that's 20 times 12, that's $240 a year. Um, and in Denver, I was selling them for five bucks for a year. Now that's a huge difference. That's good news, right? I mean, I thought that was really good news. You know what was even better news? I got $6 worth of commission on every subscription I sold. <laughs> a couple years later, the newspapers went bankrupt. <laughs> Yeah, they, they were in the price war too long, and they just, they just ran out of money. So then another company came in, bought them out, merged them, and now there's only one newspaper out there. I can't remember what it's called. It's like the Rocky Mountain Denver Post or something like that. Anyway, so, um, so they had the, the one newspaper that I was working with. I would get $6 commission. The subscription was, would, was $5. If I was smart, I would have signed everybody up and paid for it myself. In fact, I offered to do that for a couple people because I'd earn a dollar at least on every single one of them. I'd just keep this ball rolling. Um, so here's the deal. I was standing there knowing that I had the best deal in the world. There was enough coupon savings in one newspaper to offset the cost of the entire year. Okay. I knew I had the best deal in the world. And so I'd stand there and it'd be like free newspaper. And they'd just walk by free newspaper. And they just walk by. And I'm like, I'm trying to give them a free newspaper because I can't just say, Hey, $5 for a year subscription, $5 for a year subscription, because that just, you know, there's too many syllables there. They just walk right past. Uh, there's another time when they actually had in the Denver Post, and uh, this is, I'm going a little long, but I think I'll tell you anyway. They had in the Denver Post, these little cards from Eddie Bauer that were worth 10 bucks. It was for Christmas. It was like a Christmas promotion Eddie Bauer was doing. Every single newspaper had one of these $10 gift cards from Eddie Bauer in it. Serious. And it, it was like cash, money, but it was on this gift card. And I'm standing there trying to give people free newspapers with $10 cash inside the newspaper, asking for them just to take the newspaper, even if they don't want the subscription for $5 for the whole year. So um, people just kept walking past. Eventually what I did is I went to the warehouse and I stacked up about 300 newspapers. And then I 
gave some of them, and I gave some of them to my friends. And I bought everybody Eddie Bauer um, presents that year. It was pretty awesome. And I called to make sure it was all cool and legal and kosher and stuff, and they said it was cool. So anyway, that's another story. Here's the deal. I'm giving people the best deal in the world, and they're walking right past me. Why? Because they don't have a newspaper problem. If they want the newspaper, they already have the newspaper. If they don't want the newspaper, they don't want the newspaper. They don't have a newspaper problem. So it's not good news unless they have a problem that my news solves. So if this is good news, there's got to be a problem that Jesus solves. In fact, according to Mark, in the first three chapters of Mark, you see Jesus solving every human problem. One of the problems the people had is that the Israelites were being ruled by an oppressive foreign government, the Romans. They needed a different son of God to be over them. And that's what happens. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, you can flip there and you can see that Mark tells us the story of Jesus walking up to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is dunking people to get them to make a new commitment of their life to, to repentance and to, and to following God with their lives. And Jesus goes up to John and John says, I don't need to baptize you. And Jesus says, I'm going to do it anyway to fulfill all righteousness because this is the right thing to do, Jesus says. And so then he gets baptized. And then as he comes up out of the water, the voice comes out of the heavens of voice comes out of heaven saying, this is my son. So whatever Caesar says about himself, he might call himself the son. The Pharaoh might call himself the son of God. But, but the voice from heaven is God himself saying, this one's my son. This guy, this dude right here, I'm telling you, he's my son. So, so Mark tells us that Jesus is the guy. If you need a new ruler, Jesus is the one. Go on to the next verse. And you see in Mark 1, um, beginning in verse 12, it says that Jesus is sent off into the desert to be tempted. He's sent off into the desert to be tempted. And I got to ask you this question. How many of you have ever had a personal encounter with Satan himself? I mean, 8 billion people on the planet. How often has he paid attention to you directly? But he did for Jesus. He shows up and he tempts Jesus. And no matter how he tempts Jesus, Jesus goes through it with flying colors. He handles every temptation. Handles it. Go on a little further. And when you get to verse 14, Jesus begins to speak. He begins to tell people his heart message. And his heart message is this. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come, the kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus is proclaiming a new kingdom. We don't have those same problems necessarily. We've got a relatively good kingdom. We've got a relatively good political system. I know you have problems with it. I know you're judging different things and we're all trying to figure out how to fix it and who to vote for and that kind of stuff. But we have a relatively good one. These people didn't. And so Jesus is showing up and he's proclaiming, I have a brand new kingdom. Here's where it touches our lives. Have you ever been in that place where you said, man, why does God allow this bad stuff to happen? Why doesn't God just show up and end all the bad stuff? Why doesn't he just show up and eliminate it all? Why doesn't he set up his kingdom right now where he's in total control? Have you ever felt that way? That's your heart longing for a new kingdom. That's your heart longing for God to take control. The problem is if God took control, he'd have to get rid of all evil, including my stuff. But Jesus is saying, here's a new kingdom, God's kingdom, and it's right near you. He doesn't say it's shown up, it's dropped on top of you. He says it's near you. The time is now, but the kingdom is near. In other words, you and I sometime, somehow have ability to access the kingdom. It's like it's right next to me. I got to get into it somehow. The rest of the Gospel of Mark will tell us more about how to get into that kingdom and how to be part of it. But let's go on a little further. In verse 21 and 28, a guy comes up to Jesus and he's, he's got demons inside him. And Jesus says to the man, he first he says to the demons, shut up. And then he says to the, to the demons, get out of the man. And so the demons leave the man and the man is now left and he's normal. He's, he's psychologically, socially, uh, spiritually healthy and normal. And the demon is gone and the people are around him going, whoa there. 
And we learn from that that evil itself is no match for Jesus. Evil is no match for Jesus. And then right after that, people start bringing sick people to Jesus. And this guy with leprosy comes up to Jesus and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus does it. So then we learn that sickness is no match for Jesus. Evil is no match for Jesus. Sickness is no match for Jesus. Listen, so far, I hope this stuff sounds like good news. There's a guy who came to this earth and he's conquered every human problem that we've talked about so far. And there's one more problem that he addresses head on. If you've got your Bibles there, flip to chapter two. And I'm going to tell you this story, but you can skim through the pages there to make sure I'm telling it right. What happens is Jesus comes to the town, to his hometown, and he's beginning to teach people. He's beginning to uh, teach people about this new kingdom that's coming. And he goes to this house and everybody wants to come to him with their sick and their wounded and their hurting and the people with leprosy and the people who are oppressed by demons. Massive. They're huge. All these people are just piling in there. And so Jesus is inside this house teaching. I don't know whose house it is. It's probably not Jesus's house. It's, It's probably not any one of the disciples' houses. I don't know whose house it is. But they're in this house. And while they're there, the crowds just keep coming. And so there's all these people around the house outside and it's just packed. And he's trying to teach. And here come these guys, these four dudes, and they've got a friend, and the friend is paralyzed. He's lying on a mat. He's never been able to walk, and they're carrying him. And they have this idea, Jesus heals people. If sickness is no match for Jesus, then maybe, maybe this guy can be healed too. And so they're, wanting, they're bringing him to Jesus, but when they get there, their crowd is too big. They can't get inside. So what do they do? Back in that day, the roofs of the houses were flat, and they all had stairs going up because that was their deck. That's where they hung out during the summer. And so these guys climbed up the stairs to get to the roof and they start digging a hole through the ceiling. I mean, that's like, imagine right now, if someone started digging a hole through the ceiling, we would get out of here fast. I tell you, that would be, that would be weird and creepy. But if you heard, you know, the saws are going, some guy's saws all sticks down through there and he starts chopping around. The drywall is cracking and falling and dust is in the air and all this stuff. And I can't talk anymore because you're all distracted. And, you know, it's coming down. These guys are digging through this mud roof, this mud and straw roof. And as they're digging through it, the sound is underneath. I mean, you hear the crackling of the roof doing something. It's dirty. There's dust in the air. Everybody's covered in like this dirt and mud and the sweat that they already had on them. Now it's all getting caked in mud. And so now there's a hole coming.